Well, I left school at the age of 15 and I immediately went underground at the Mardi Colliery in the Ronda. Yes, I did have a choice of whether I went underground or whether I would continue further education. Uh, I chose to go underground for personal reasons in the sense I was the last generation in my family uh, to complete coal mining in our family. I think I was the fourth generation, both on my mother and my father's side. So I, I felt, if I can say it was in my blood, it was something that I wanted to do for that reason, to continue, if you like, the family history in my name, but also from a political perspective, because I was quite a young political person at a very young age. And for me to follow my identity, that I wanted to be a part of the National Union of Mine Workers. Well, Going underground in the early 60s, a lot of it was changing over from what we call orthodox mining, where you were using shovel and wooden props, wooden supports, and there was a change over to mechanization, where machines would replace the man in terms of using the shovel. So when I went down in the early 60s, uh, I went on an orthodox coal face, the nine feet seam, and um, I, I would use a shovel, and I would probably, at the age of 15, I would load out from the stent, we called it a stent, it was measured right through the face, that everyone had the same measurement, so we called it stents. And it was nothing for me to shovel 10, 15 tons of coal uh, in a shift and then stand our timber. We'd have to saw the timber all by hand, by a bow saw. And it was really, uh, it, it was really heavy, hard work. Many times I would go home too tired to eat my dinner. I'd have to go and have a lie down on the settee and my mother would call me after an hour or two my dinner would be ready uh, because I was too tired when I came in from work. Well, um, conditions can vary in terms of temperature from one part of the mine to another. Conditions altered in terms of um, wetness because some seams were affected by water, by egress of water. Uh, some seams were dustier, because when I worked in the nine feet, that was quite dusty, because it's, it's quite a, a, a high seam, and it generated uh, more coal dust. And then, it <clears throat> and then there was uh, differences in temperature. One part of the mine could be warm, and then one part of the mine could be cold. So you want all these differences, temperature, um, water, so humidity could change, and all these things. And you, you ask the question, well, what, what, why do miners have chest diseases? Well, it's because of those changing various conditions that you uh, have to experience, cold, wet, dry, hot, dusty. So when you put all those things together, it, it really challenges the lungs, doesn't it? Well, when I first started um, in, in Mardi Colliery, um, we would have a, a, a coal face of about 200 metres long. And uh, on the coal face, you could have uh, and it was split in half, so you could have on one side probably uh, 
10, 10 stents, which would involve 20 men on one side and 20 men on the other side. So you could have 40 men in a face. Because when you started uh, as a young man in the mine, you'd work with a batty because you were inexperienced. Uh, you'd work with someone who was very experienced. So uh, we, 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 we were all quite young going on to this phase. The, and there were all different ta challenges between the different types of boys that went there. Some were tall, some were short, some were stout, some were thin. And sometimes in a mine, uh, conditions would challenge you because uh, you could be working in narrower seams, which wasn't very favorable for tall people or for large people. But for me, being five foot four, um, it was probably the best height. And at the time, I was uh, training, to, I was an amateur boxer, so my weight was always kept quite low and I was quite fit. So um, I think most. Most of the boys felt it challenging in the beginning until obviously you had been down the mine for a couple of years where you've got used to uh, the hard work, the physical work, and then you've got probably uh, m more conditioned to the environment, having to work in the dark, having to use a cap lamp, and your head would have to direct itself to give light to where you wanted to work. I think your question is, how long did I work as a, as a real miner on the face? Yes, I mean, I, I probably did about two years as a, as, as a face worker, as we called them. But I never came off the coal face because I then trained, uh, I did an apprenticeship as an electrical uh, engineer and my responsibilities and my training and my qualification then allowed me to carry on the installation of coal faces and the maintenance of coal faces. So I was always on the coal face. From the early days, uh, mining was, was manual. Then after the 1947 nationalization, a lot of mechanization came into the pits. So if I talk about the first coal face I worked on, uh, that was run by compressed air. Compressed air which was uh, produced at the surface and sent down the pit via pipes. And so the conveyors in the face were run by compressed air. As mechanization was introduced, we replaced that with electricity on the coal face. So when I, when I first started in the 60s, we had 500 volts on the coal face. We had transformers, which would um, have 3,300 volts on the primary side, and then 500 volts on the secondary side. So the motors operating the face conveyors were 500 volts. It was an armoured conveyor in the coal face, um, which was a very heavy conveyor. So uh, any of the of the, the massive size lumps of coal that came onto it wouldn't damage the conveyor because it was steel. It was a steel armoured conveyor. Then as it came out to the coal face, it would come out onto what we call the gate end, and then it would go onto a rubber conveyor, normally uh, a 36 inch uh, rubber conveyor. But as, as, as equipment grew, as the mechanization um, improved, the, the 500 volts on the coal face turned into 1100 volts. So we had bigger motors, therefore you required higher voltages. So it was nothing um, to have three um, 75 horsepower motors running a face conveyor. Um, no, it didn't really, because we used the machine instead of the shovel. 
and, and that was the uh, progression that was being made during the 1960s, uh, that we were coming away from what we call conventional mining, orthodox mining, onto mechanization mining. So af after the two, two years that I had completed, um, in, in the pit that I was in, it, it had come over to the, what, what I can say uh, was the new mechanization that was coming into the industry. Actually, my, my first connection with the trade union was, was in my home in Excelsior Terrace, Mardi, where uh, my mother was relating stories of my grandmother, Ellen Tudor, uh, an absolute lovely lady, very compassionate lady. She had a shop in Mardi, and during the difficult periods uh, of the 20s and 30s, when unemployment was, was rising, when the coal uh, owners would lock the miners out, there would be starvation in the community. Uh, and my, my aunt, uh, my grandmother would actually give away the profits and give away her shop to feed starving families. But then, my mother then said, but she not only did that, because my mother used to serve in the shop. My, my mother was old enough to, to remember it all. She said she would support the Miners' Federation in Mardi, the lodge, because um, the bailiffs would be trying to throw people out of their houses through non-payment of rent. And, and, and my grandmother, was a big supporter of, of the Mardi Lodge. And on one occasion, she was arrested, and I think um, she was charged with a riot, an unlawful assembly, and she had to appear in Crown Court in Cardiff. And, uh, and she was found guilty, and she was sentenced to hard labor in a jail in Cardiff. And that was the first time I had heard of of, of the Mardi Lodge and the National, or, or the Miners' Federation in those days. And that really affected me to, to think that a woman that was so compassionate and cared for others, her only crime was, uh, is caring for people. And as a result, she served time. And it shortened her life. It affected her her longevity. My mother said she died a young woman because it, it had such a, a traumatic effect on her. Well, when I spoke about my grandmother, that was during the times that the Mardi Lodge was part of the Federation of Mine Workers. Uh, when, when I went underground, and that was my provocation really to, um, to be part of uh, a community of, of men. I mean, I could say women if they were down the pit, but there was no women uh, down the pit. Uh, I want the provocation for me was to go down the pit and to join the Mardi Lodge. And within months of me going down the pit at the age of 15, I, I was um, accepted onto the lodge committee in Mardi, onto the Mardi Lodge, as a youth representative. Uh, I then, obviously, uh, the pit was quite big then. I think there was about 11 to 1,200 men. So there was a couple of hundred young men, um, some my age, some a little bit older, and I would represent them on the Lodge Committee. And the Lodge Committee normally, um, probably about 20 to 25 men of, of different ages. And as the years went on, I, I became uh, the vice chairman of the lodge. And then I finally uh, became the chairman of the lodge. Uh, and, it, and really, for me, uh, it was a pinnacle of, of, of my 
position in the lodge because I was following people like Arthur Lewis Horner who became the National General Secretary of the Mine Workers Union, the National Union of Mine Workers. And I was also following Emlyn Williams who was the South Wales President of the, of the NOM. So it is quite an auspicious position to hold. But my primary reasons for it was not just to follow them. I, I, I've always been a person that would want to represent others. And I suppose in, in simple layman's language, I would talk for them who couldn't, talk, who couldn't talk for themselves. And I found myself doing this in school, but I was uh, a youngster in school. You know, there was quite a lot of racism at the type, time in school, and I, I stood up for certain people um, at a cost to myself, but I, I didn't mind that. So I was quite used to being a, a voice, if you like, for someone else. So in uh, 1972, we had an, a national strike for, for wages. But prior to that, in, in the late 60s, we had uh, unofficial strikes, uh, which involved overtime bans uh, leading up to the 1972 strike, because we wanted to reduce uh, the coal imports on the, on the coal stocks in the power stations. So in 1972, we had a national strike, which um, we made a demand on wages, because at the time we were at the bottom of the wages league, and uh, we felt it's time now that uh, miners were paid proper, proper earnings. Uh, and uh, we won that strike. We had a big, uh, we had a big um, demonstration in Saltley Gates Depot, uh, and that was the pinnacle of the 72 strike. Uh, everybody knows the 72 strike from the Salt Lee Gates victory. And then we had the 1974 strike. And during that two years, our, our wages had eroded even further. So we made demands to the coal board. Uh, it ended up with a three-day week, working week. Um, power stations had very little coal. And Ted Heath was the Prime Minister at the time. And he thought, right, he could, he could beat the miners on this by going to the country. Uh, because, you know, obviously the lights were, go were going off on some uh, days of the week. He went to the country and he was turned down. And we actually then uh, defeated the Tory government in 1974. Well, uh, systematically every area of the British coalfield uh, was suffering with pit closures. Uh, if I can give an example, let's say in the Ronda, we had four pits uh, back in the 60s and the 70s. When they closed the mine then, normally those miners would be transferred to the neighboring pit. So it wasn't compulsory redundancy. You weren't being thrown out of a job. You were actually being transferred to another pit. But when we talk about the 84 situation, uh, we had come to the end of that um, transfer of men to another pit because the policy of the coal board and the government, because then you had the Thatcher government, Margaret Thatcher was a prime minister, and uh, the plan and the objective then was to rely on cheap imports of coal and gas at the expense of the British coal field. And her real plan wasn't just to close cotton wood or just a couple of pits in the Yorkshire coal field. Her, her end game was to close the British coal field. She maintained that it was cheaper um, to import coal but then you have to examine uh, really how the, the, the coal was being produced. It was, it was inferior compared to our coal because in fact coal produced in the Ronda was the finest steam coal in the world. It was powering the British Navy during previous wars. So uh, the argument 
of, of it being cheaper to import doesn't hold water really because if you're going to put miners onto the dole, you're going to have to pay them uh, unemployment benefit. Well, Margaret Thatcher's vision for a future conservative government was to be able to uh, carry out her policies unhindered, and that meant by weakening the trade union movement. And at that time, uh, the National Union of Mine Workers was at the vanguard of the trade union movement. I mean, she had brought over people like Ian McGregor from America. She had uh, em employed him in the car industry. He had devastated the car industry in the Midlands. Then he, he went as the boss of, of British Steel. And overnight, he decimated our steel industry. I mean, Ian McGregor's past, he was a multimillionaire. He didn't care about the effects of, of the industrial decline of Britain. He, he had a philosophy, and his philosophy was in line with Margaret Thatcher's. And whatever she called for, he obeyed. And then she employed him in the coal industry. He knew nothing about coal, and she would advance the argument it was about efficiency, it was about him being able to produce coal a lot cheaper than anywhere else in the world. But that wasn't true. What was true, that she wanted to smash the unions, smash the NOM, smash, uh, smash other unions and that would follow in order that would have a weak trade union movement so she could, uh, she could hold office indefinitely. So, I mean, the, in, the intention of, of Margaret Thatcher was to close the, the entire British coal field down. But uh, it was always denied. It was denied by the coal board, by McGregor. It was denied by Margaret Thatcher. But actually, you know, history's on our side. Because after the 1984-85 miners' strike, by the 1990s, they had almost closed the entire British coal field down. There weren't many pits. Almost 170,000 miners had lost their jobs. So history is on our side. It's on the side of, of miners and the communities that struggled because um, it's there to be seen. The coal field it no longer exists. exists. It's gone. It's closed. You've got remnants of, of open cast. You have one or two uh, deep mines which are privately owned, probably by, and I know, a lot of American investment. So th th there isn't much uh, of, of deep mining, and what's left is open cast mining. Well, uh, <clears throat> as you know, my miners were trained uh, to mine coal. And the government and the coal would give wonderful pictorials towards retraining, redirection of industry, regeneration. I mean, they were trying to make job losses a bit more comfortable. They were trying to convince miners to say, OK, your pit's closing, but we will look after you. We will do this, we'll do that. But sadly to say, it, it didn't come to pass. Um, most miners didn't work after the pit closed. Most miners were unemployed. Uh, there was very little retraining, very little or no direction of industry. So you had huge populations of, of the mining valleys with, with high levels of unemployment. And, uh, and, and still today. Um, I was fortunate because I was a qualified uh, electrical engineer. I was able to, to work and uh, as soon as the pit closed I was able to find work and I, I never failed to work. 
But, but that's not the story for the vast majority of miners. And as I, as I look back and I try to learn the lessons of how to look forward and how to, if you like, rekindle our community. I mean, we, we talk a lot now about the environment. We talk a lot now about green energy. <clears throat> and I had a little chat last week, in fact, to someone. I said, see the wind, wind farms. See, see the production of electricity on top of the mountains. We would naturally assume that the um, investment and the development of those wind farms came from Wales or the UK. Because he said, well, we must be earning fantastic profits. Well, I said, I don't think so, because the Swedish company produced each generator, the Swedish company installed them, and the Swedish company had taken the profits back to Sweden. Now, there has to be a change. You know, we were one of the fine, finest engineering countries in the world. We produced ships, we produced aeroplanes, we produced trains. I mean, our engineering skills go right across the world. Why can't we develop our own industries in Wales? Why can't we use the wind and the tidal uh, changes we have in the Bristol Channel to produce our own energy, producing our own jobs and keeping the profits back in Wales and reinvested in Wales. And we have to look forward to that, to give our communities hope, you know. And I'm quite positive that if we look at regeneration in the right way, if we take into account the environment and what, what's needed to safeguard and improve the environment by green energy, then we can secure a future for our future uh, generations. But there has to be some changes in our thought. We have to come away from the fact that we are subservient to the bubble in London, that they control our lives, that governments like we've had over the last 14 years are tearing the guts out of Wales. We have to have a different way of thinking. We have to be more positive that we can control our own lives, that we can go forward and we can make the changes that are necessary.